All right, um, welcome to Six Scale, everybody. Um, so a few announcements. Uh, so for today, um, next week, um, next week, next Thursday, the 29th, July 29th, um, I'm gonna be out the whole week. Um, so we could, we haven't, we could have a uh, meeting if folks want to, but I, I'm gonna need a volunteer. If someone wants to, to host the meeting, I can give you the, um, the admin control so you can start the recording and self recording, et cetera. Um, or we can not have a meeting. I, I don't know what people prefer, but does someone want to volunteer to, to run this next week while I'm out? Or do you, uh, do you want to skip it? Uh, yeah, I don't mind running it if we have things to talk about. Let's see how uh, this meeting goes. And okay. if we uh, feel at the end that we need to sync again next week, then I can run it. All right. OK, sounds good. Um, all right, so let's get started with the uh, first things. Um, it's, I don't know if Marcelo joined, um, but he, maybe he's got a conflict today. So the um, so last time we talked about um, this document from Marcelo's experiments, um, where we got a bunch of information about um, from the from Grafana. I took this and, um, oh, it looks like there's, Marcelo might be talking about it right now. Um, so the uh, we, I took these and I, I created a bunch of issues from them. Um, there could be more here, um, but I figured we could just quickly go through them and see if they make sense to people uh, and things that are actionable and, and are also accurate based on what we saw in that document. Um, so I posted the, the graphs here based on uh, and the metrics and, and just kind of drew a conclusion. So this is the first one. Um, so API requests to Qubit IO virtual machine instances returns 404s. Uh, so our expectation um, on this one, right, is that we don't see this. Um, like we don't expect to have a bunch of 404s on this, on this API. So, and it just, and it's really got worse every time uh, as we created more VMIs, we just saw a lot more requests. I mean, that kind of makes sense. We're making a lot more requests to this API and it's, just, it's returning a 404. Um, so does that make sense as something to to have? Um, I as a as an issue here, or is this something that I mean? Do we expect this? I mean, I I, I don't think so. Right? I mean, like this is we should at least investigate it. So it's good to have an issue for it. I say. Yeah. All right. Uh, further than investigating, I think that we can make it go away. We should make it go away. We shouldn't see anything grow like this. I don't think. Um, okay, I saw that's an error I, request. Yeah, I saw. I think. Um, because he does have the Kubernetes metrics in here. And I thought I saw that, that Kubernetes also gets these. I mean, it's not a good thing, but um, that's just another data point. So there, there, yeah, there, there can be cases like of valid cases where you are just basically just trying to get an object to see if it still exists or something in a controller loop. It, so it's- That's actually a good question. I, what, not necessarily we, an issue, but we need to find out why it exists. and. Yeah, well, maybe we can define it. Like, so what is, what exactly, what is, what's happening here when we're hitting this 404? We're calling this, we're calling a, a um, is it that we're trying to request a virtual machine instance and it's just not there? Or is it that we're like, what is it that we're doing? Because this, this metric is read. read we don't know. Or something. We're trying okay, to so recall we uh, a get on a resource and the resource is not there. So what resource we're calling, we do not know. So it could be anything. We have like 12 controllers. Anything that's keying off a of VMI is that's calling a get on something could be causing this. For example, the pod disruption budget. If we were calling a get on pod disruption budgets every time a VMI gets queued, then that would cause a 404. Or even the like more like snapshot controllers and things like that could possibly do it as well. We have to investigate it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay, we'll keep it in. Sounds good. All right, we'll go to the next one. Um, this one is for controller disruption budget work queue. Um, ad rate is very high. So creating a lot of VMs, we just get um, we get this um, in the work queue ad rate. It's just so much higher than the other. Um, in the other um, metrics here, vert handler, vert controller. And this is, yeah, another one. Why is that happening? I, I actually, I think I defined it. Yeah, I did. Okay. So the total number of ads handled by a work queue. Yeah. Why, why is this one so much higher than any, than any other one? Um, 
may lead to like there might be like another issue buried underneath this, but this could be like the at least get us to you know um, a little bit closer to what's going on. Does Marcelo have the exact BMI spec that he uses, or is there a way we can drive that? Is it just the one used in the density test, or is there something else? Do we know? Did he end up posting it here? He posted kind of the shape of the VMI, like how much memory and, uh, and like the image it uses, Ceros and okay. stuff like that. But I didn't see the spec. So the reason that's useful for us is certain things trigger these other controllers in the VMI right. spec. So for example, an eviction strategy set to live migrate uh, is going to have a different behavior than one that doesn't have that set, uh, potentially. So. Yep. OK. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Let's get let's get a little bit more information than this one he used. Okay. Uh, next one's the work key performance. This one's kind of general. I I I thought about splitting this up into a bunch of different ones, but it just kind of seemed all related here in some way. So, uh, first metric was the work key latency. Um, mm. This was worst case, I think. Right? I don't. Let me see if it's got it. Yeah, so for, for that, I would really just uh, yeah, leave it as one issue until we have the possibility to configure QoS and read limit and do the tests again. So, because it really looks yeah. like it. At least right now, they have to be high pretty much. There is not, not, not any other chance even. And as soon as we have it, we can then see what remains high and then investigate that. All right. Let me, um, you have your um, your pull request somewhere in here, right? It's, uh, yeah. Is it this one? Oh, yeah, yeah, this one. All right, I'm gonna just link it to this. So let's, let's test this again. Uh, let's let's gather. All right, let's see if it's... All right, let's do that. Then it'll give us, let's see the changes. Yeah, okay. Um, next one. So the go routine count and memory remains high after VMIs are removed. This one was weird. Yeah, I mean, the level of go routines just stays that way, even when we are, we've got no VMIs. Um, memory, and, and there's even another question here, but could, I didn't create you, an, an, you increase the yeah. picture a little bit? It might lose some quality, right. but yeah. So the so what I was saying is the you can see like the go routines, um, the line, the baseline when we have no VMs, it steadily increases as we create more, which yeah. is interesting. Um, CPU usage stays um, down. This was a weird metric. This is. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Time spent using the CPU um, as opposed to like like percent or like number of CPUs you used or something. Um, memory, it seems like it kind of generally is on an incline. Well, except for this maybe the yellow line. Some of them are going yeah, out, but it's pretty small, just a few yeah. megabytes. But and then there's another, yeah, and then there's another. Yeah. yeah, there's another test. Well, I, is there, I, does Qbert currently, like does the upstream currently have um, requests for a bird handler? That, that would be kind of one thing that made me think of this. Um, like I know at least in, like internally, like we set requests, uh, we we have some requests on it um, for memory, but I don't know if it's something that's currently- Yeah, we set some... requests, but uh, no limits. Uh, and yeah, okay. we also don't plan to set limits, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, and then the other the other question here was that I that I brought up was um, if we fill the nodes, um, you know, does like do we still see the uh, the memory climb? Like, you know, let's say like we have three nodes and they have a hundred VM limit, we fill them. Does like is that um, do we see increased memory for that? Like just to know if like if there's some sort of other um, if it has any correlation with the number of VMIs or if it's just simply like we have a vert handler that's at max capacity. Um, so that's another question, but we haven't we haven't figured that out though. That's just something that kind of looks here, something that we will need to figure out. 
um, at some point, but um, that's that's kind of what I wanted to get at is some other tests that we can do. Okay, so that's that one. Um, all right, so those are the four issues. Were there any other ones that we could think of uh, that need to go or that need to be created on this? I mean, um, should I break the, I don't know, did, does anyone have any leftovers? I think that's kind of what I had. RPC rate, then finish work. I had a thought uh, after the meeting last week about the 409s. So that, that's what okay. my PR, I had, I had a PR that helped address that. Under load, we actually see less 409s because the queue is backed up, which gives the informers huh. more time to catch up. So the 409s would actually only become an issue when we become more efficient. Uh, they're, they're efficient at low scale. And then as we become more efficient at high scale, we, we would start seeing them, I think, again. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, okay. That's, that's another, well, okay, well, well I've already have like, I, this is kind of what I wanted to do in the evaluation sections. Um, I want to start like defining things that we can like, cause we have, all, now we've got like this data and stuff, like um, things that we can evaluate. So let me just write this one. So like, um, so four nines, um, probably after the QPS change, we need to actually, we need to do the QPS change. So QPS, um, change uh, and then and measure or Q efficiency and then following that um, we want to see if the four nines uh, affect effect um, with an efficient work queue under high load. That's another one. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't, do you think it should be, I mean, I don't think we need to have issues with these. I think we could just keep them like this or something, or maybe I could just create an issue, just kind of load these all in there and we can just check them off or something. I don't know. All right. We'll just go with this for now. And if it becomes a problem, I can create an Sounds issue good. for it. Yep. All right. Wait. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next item. Um, so baseline thresholds, um, I created this this morning. So I talked about this um, recently. I was trying to find the right way to like um, make this usable. Um, I was gonna start with, like really simple for this. So basically um, the goal is to have some source of truth so that CI can um, read performance scale metrics per release. So like every time like we go to where release four three, we'll have some sort of um, code that's that hangs around that just holds these, these um, thresholds in place so that, you know, for when we run CI for like backports and stuff, or just if people want to consume, uh, have CI that's, that runs externally, we can just, we'll have this. This is what like our expectation is. Um, and all I figured we do is we just add a bunch of, of uh, constants in here that kind of builds um, our list of things. And we just have a process for approving these, these thresholds based on what we know about the release and, uh, um, and what we want to measure. So that's what uh, I was yeah, I've been this. thinking about this yeah. as well. So I think it makes okay. sense to commit um, at least some sort of expectations into the code base around this. Uh, are we thinking about using that that tool that I was creating that would retroactively gather or report results in order to determine these thresholds, or how? What were you envisioning here? Yeah, I think we. I, so I took these from um, Marcelo's tests. But yeah, we would uh, we would refine. So like, what I'm thinking is like kind of my like long term, medium long term here with this is that we eventually get to a point where, like, when we cut a release, we we know what these are. We just kind of like when we cut the release, we we set them in stone, and then we we cut the release, and here's our here's our um, here's what we expect. Like, if you don't change the code base, this is what you should see all the time, and, and so. We use um, this as that source of truth, and we gather we kind of we gather that data like on the day we do the release from your tool uh, to figure out to set all all of these up. Um, so we so I, I kind of see it as like um, um, it's like it's it's our way of communicating like what exactly what's uh, what our expectations are what, what, uh, for this. Mm -hmm. Does that so, make sense? Yeah, I I had just. I would say like just thinking my PR before, my huge PR that I had before. So then we simplified that. Um, 
the idea was actually that thing that you mentioned. So, for example, we have jobs running for PRs or daily. I think we should start daily now just to make it easier, you know, to run those tests. And then we, we define this threshold some, somewhere. I think it's good the, way, the place that you did. And, so, and then we were discussing the framework to collect this and, and then to uh, compare the, the results in it. So maybe we can combine everything. So this uh, threshold that you define here, plus the David um, tools to compare the, the experiments. So, and then, and then it should, you know, rise some uh, alert or fail a test. Then we should discuss that. What's better? So. Yeah, so I, have... I like the idea of representing thresholds, and I think I can uh, use like create some sort of config that that we can pass into that perf tool that I was working on, the one that gathers results, uh, where we can say these are the thresholds we want to meet. And did we meet them or not? And have that in the results or in the, some, something to tell us if we passed or failed our thresholds as well. So we can have mm -hmm. all this represented in a config. Uh, so our thresholds represented in a config and then pass that into the perf tool to get uh, the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the my initial idea, like the first version of the PR, um, I, I use I put this in a YAML, so a configuration file. And then we could like uh, easily change, you know, the thresholds, and everyone can maybe change that according to their environment if it's running, you know. Exactly, that's the big thing. So we need this per environment because it only makes sense per yeah. environment. So I think I, I like the thresholds. Can we move it to the test package and maybe have like a perf scale um, subdirectory in the test package, mm -hmm. and then have these configs per an environment, the threshold configs per an environment. That's what I think would make most sense. Well, so one, well, one question about this that uh, maybe I'm clarify. So the um, so per environment, I, I understand that. So we use it as a config. But what about like? Um, oh, okay. I think I understand what you mean per environment. So like, if uh, let's say like uh, we're like I'm, I'm in the mindset of like when when we release this, you know, how we're going to communicate this. So w would this be like in a hundred nodes? here's what we expect uh, to see for your per scale thresholds. Is it, is that, is that kind yeah, of what you're yeah, I would say like, it's not similar. It's simpler. It's more like the, the environment where you run the tests are just very different. The, the machine you're running Kubernetes on can be fast or slow, for instance. That's the initial step where it can hugely differ. So, yeah. yeah. You just yeah, pick the config sure. you want to run against, uh, your threshold config when you're running the test. So the perf uh, test that's running like daily or whatever, when we create that automation job, maybe there's a CLI argument or uh, environment variable or whatever that we specify the threshold config we want to compare against that matches the environment that we're testing against and then it's just always used. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, okay. because if we have it hard coded, so every time that we change the environment, we we need to you know change this. Also, for example, let's assume some someone wants to run Kubevert in their local environment and want to test also. So if this is configurable, they can you know use this test there. So it's it's more like generic. So. Anyway, so right now our focus, of course, it's in our CI environment, but it's make it useful for more people. Just saying that. Yeah. Okay. I. I so I, I do like to do. So I'll, I'll. I can move this. Um. I'll move this over to to where you're working, David. And then the, so the other thing, it's kind of the other question because this this I I just wanted to clarify. So like, what like what do people think that that because like this is where I'm kind of working toward with this is like we have some way to say like um with the release like what our expectations are should we would we say that like um like this is like should we create sort of that expectation i guess is sort of the question here because like what we're saying is it's going to be we're, we're aiming toward per environment um for our testing for our thresholds should we even go that route of saying okay here's what um 
our expectation is for performance for this release? Is that even something we want to go? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. we need to say well, that. So how would in we? The environment how, that we have. But yeah. like we keep saying the environment, like because if we keep saying that, how could we say that we're trying to? We expect you to meet this level of performance if we're saying at the same time that the environment's going to be. Yeah, different. I mean, uh, it, when you run it on a metal machine with your, with your F one IBM cloud, then it has maybe faster CPUs or something. So it will. I mean, for the release, we of course have to compare it to the same machines, but. When you're doing local experiments, you're not running on the same machines like on CI, and you may want to change some parts. I think that's all what this is about. Yeah. For example, you have a cluster that you run some experiments in NVIDIA. And if you want to check you know, the performance times to times in your cluster, you need to have different thresholds. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's faster or is lower. Right. No, no. I, I yeah, so I get that. So I get the configurable aspect of it. All, all I'm all I'm saying is like um like I had mentioned. So like so what makes sense to me is like we I got one of the goals I laid out here was that it, like we want it to be like used by CI and evaluate. And so like well, what we talked about last time was that the tool that David's using is configurable and that the performance is going to be specific to the environment that it runs on. That that makes sense to me because we want to compare apples to apples. Um, and so. The other part of this, though, is that uh, it's like I'm saying, every release that we do of Qvert, like, do we want to say like what our expected thresholds are? But it, like, if like, can we can we like say that if we're also saying like um, we expect like without saying without specifying any sort of like hardware requirements or like saying if you use this script or something like that? Yeah, the expected. I guess we... It's expected for. Um... It's the expected requirements based on our CI hardware. That's it. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's not publicly, okay. this is what you would expect. I mean, if you completely reproduced our environment, then yeah, the, the, you would expect to get the I same thing. I think that's what Kubernetes is doing. So they say, this is the cluster that we have, and this is the, you know, what they say, SLOs that we expect in, in this environment. They, yeah. they, we okay. can, they cannot guarantee things in different environments. So just saying. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. I just wanted to clarify because, like, the just around the page, same page. So this is what I was trying to find Kubernetes. Um, they have a whole section where they wrote about this with SLIs and SLOs. Um, I, I created it, but... something very similar for us. Let me share the document. No, I think we never discussed that. So maybe it's a good time. <laughs> Okay, um, I think, well, so let me take this. So I'll, I'm gonna move this over. Um, so I'll wait till David, your patch merges and then um, I'll move this over there and test and we'll, um, um, we can just make it configurable or uh, yeah, that's fine. Or if yeah, you wanna add it, sense. David, I don't-, I don't uh, Here's care. what I'll do. Um, so I will add thresholds to my PR. So the ability to pass in some sort of YAML and define your thresholds and then in the yeah. reports file, you'll, you'll understand if you met your thresholds or not. Uh, then you can consume that when the patch lands. So I'll try to get that done today. Maybe we can get that in this week, and then we can start using that in CI, um, you know, soon. Uh, okay. When are you leaving on, uh, I assume, PTO, Ryan? Yeah, I'm going to be out um, the last day of Friday. I'm going to be out of Friday. next week. Yeah. Uh, wait, so, so next week, you're this Friday, you're leaving? Yes, so I'll be out, I'll be out all next week. Okay, they, are you actually going to be here tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be here tomorrow. Okay, maybe we can. Uh, I'll see what I can get done today. Maybe we can make some progress right before you leave, or at least get okay. things uh, where. Yeah, we'll see. We'll talk. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And then that, that works for me. And if 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 not, we can just. I mean, we can just throw it in your PR. That's that's fine, too. Okay. Um, all right. That's good for me. I, I think like, so I understand here. So like baseline thresholds will have like, um, so we'll have like our definition, like I said, like, um, so like what, oh, someone's got the, yeah, the, this is, uh, so like we basically, um, let's like, like define SLI, like SLO per release based on CIs, um, uh, based on CI. And that's how we can communicate it. And then we'll, and then the tool will just be per 
um, we'll use it kind of as a developer tool per um, environment. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, um, cool. So let's go to um, evaluations next. Uh, so these, I, all I want to do with this was just kind of come up with a list of other tests that we can do here. Now that we have like, um, we already have the, uh, the, the different performance sort of phase changes uh, for VMIs. We have a bunch of things that have merged. Um, I just kind of wanted to like enumerate a list here of, uh, of tests that we kind of, we want to do just to kind of start building towards like these baselines, start refining them. Um, do people have any ones that we add this list? I think the first one we got to do is like, we had to bring in that QPS change, measure the work queue efficiency again, and then it sounds like four nines would follow and see how that, how that changes things. Do we have any other ones we want to do? Like specific numbers of VMIs, um, specific scale? I don't know. Maybe those are I think Ricciardo ran in his initial tests exactly what we would want to evaluate and just see mm -hmm. if I can I can rerun that when it's get merged, and then it I I think it ideally I will going to prepare the the pro job to run like daily for the the dense test that we have, so that we can you know start to check it like a, you know um, in a high level you know way that we can go to a Grafana, public Grafana dashboard and check things. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, maybe at, maybe at that. Right. Yeah. But, but Which one? Before Sorry, that, the... uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I, I, I wasn't clear. Like, what, what did you want me to add? Uh, yeah, the, the, the daily pro job with the scale test that we get, collect the data for it, so that. This is the daily density test, right? Yeah. Yeah. OK. And this is um, how many VMIs is this? I, like, what's it's uh, only one hundred right now? But we can we can discuss. Maybe we can have okay. uh, the scale that I did in the you know the previous uh, test. Yeah, but yeah, that's I'm what, actually let me first run it and collect this uh, stuff. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. I, this actually brought another thought. Like. Um, uh, maybe we're not there yet. Like I, I'm thinking, like what, how if we should define how we test each of these so we have a consistent. I, I think, like Marcel, I like what you did on the. I think for these, definitely we should do the same thing that Mar same test you did, Marcel, that generated these metrics here, mm -hmm. um, because that's yeah. We want to compare exactly those dashboards before and after. I think for those two. So um, this was I, we come up with a name for this. Uh, this was like that that 10, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever, 100, 300 test. Um, I don't know, what, what do we call this? Something, I don't know, Marcelo's test. 10 to 300 VMI ramp up. So this is uh, what we wanna do for these. Okay, all right, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, and then we have our daily tests. Um, so that we can start on things and uh, start getting that going. Okay, um, so let's go to other items. So uh, uh, Roman, you got a PR here. This is the QPS change, right? So, yeah, yeah if you, this was, would just be my initial proposal on how to make stuff configurable. And basically right now we have four clients user, which we use, we have, we have two clients in Red API one for console connections and the stuff, and another one for validations. So for the webhooks, so that it's fast. And we have one for controller and one for handlers. And yeah, this way you could configure it per component, basically. Okay. So yes. are these the, the, default, the default values or you are increasing already? So, it, the 400 and 200 number on the webhook configuration at the bottom, that's what mm -hmm. we have already. That's why you never had any issues with the validation webhooks when they did anything. Um, but for controller configuration, I now increased it here in this example to, or it, I said here the, the same defaults like Kubernetes did for the controller manager. That's 13, that's 13, 20. And for the rest, I left it. And right now, what do we have? 
also 10.5. So it's, right yeah, now 10, the reality five. is 10.5, 10.5, 10.5, 400, okay. 200. So this PR increases only control of configuration, leaves the rest like it is right now. What, where was this default defined? Is this just the default within the Kubernetes client that we 10.5 is just the Kubernetes client default, yeah. Yeah. I see but, that you created, yeah. uh, like I'm just briefly looking at this. There's a, um, a package that you introduced called rate limiter. I, this is more complex than I thought it would be because I thought it would just gonna, it would just be setting something in the client that was- Yeah, automatic. we are, but, um, uh, well, I mean, I am setting the rate limit lim on the client configuration. And uh, so that I can, so the nice thing is, so in the client configuration, you can set first in QPS directly. And then the, when you create the client, a rate limiter will be created for you with this with these values. But you can also just directly pass in the rate limiter. And this has the advantage that I now created a, a wrapping rate limiter for the token bucket rate limiter from Kubernetes where it's passed in. And I tied it together with our qubit config so you can change the values on the fly. And the okay, so that, that's what you did. For you. So uh, that's where the complexity is because it's dynamic. I see. Yeah, otherwise I would have to restart all the components and this is slow and- uh, are, are we worried at all about like the, <clears throat> the locking or anything like that? Like when is this? Not really yeah. because the token bucket rate limiter uses locking anyway on every call already. Okay. So yeah, we don't get slow lock. So uh, maybe, maybe so I, I guess we added, or not I guess, I know we added a delay of one additional locked lookup but it's even a shorter lookup than the default rate limiter does. So at worst we have a very small a delay in general to the requests, which should not really be measurable, but no throttling, not more throttling. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're already- The throughput will be the same, but every call takes a very, very, very small amount longer because of the additional lookup in between every call, but yeah. Okay. Okay, and that allows us to do dynamic because we're doing, because you're doing that, um, that additional work. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it could have exposed it also via uh, command line flex, for instance, or or something like this, or yeah. Okay. Or have, and have just have to take the changes and re reboot the components, but there ahead. Right. So the issue with that is when I just, for instance, tell the handler to reboot itself when it detects changes there, then we would have to add delays there that not all, not all of them are rebooting at the same time and so on. And it's, when I yeah, just do it this way, that's... it's an absolutely simple change and fast. And sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. This is, uh, I, I don't remember what we did in, uh, internally for these. I know, I know this one was bumped up, but I don't remember what it was. So, yeah. I took the opportunity here and set it to the defaults, which also Kubernetes is using. Yeah. So they use for as defaults. I guess they are also increasing it for the density tests and so on. But yeah. Does Do they use that in, in their escape test or? In no, the it's just when you when you look at the uh, at the API docs or not the API docs at the Kubernetes docs, there you can read what the default values are for the command lines. So that for the kubelet, it's ten five. For the controllers, thirty twenty, and uh, yeah, for the API server, they don't have it because the API server directly is the receiver. Yeah. yeah. So, right. So, is there a way to, I don't know, just thinking, to measure, you know, what we should have, you know, like uh, yeah, yeah, um, you can you can just change the values on the fly. So you basically can write a test which just repeatedly oh. runs the same test with different values. We, have, we also have uh, helper functions in the tests package if you want to add, automate that easily. So there is something you can just fetch the qubit config, change the values you want, and then we have a update qubit config and wait for propagation. And once this, fu this function is done, you can run the test again and all components have the new values guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Marcello? Yeah, yeah, it's answered. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking just like, uh, for example, if you see, it's easier just to to do. Uh, I was thinking if you see like if it's throttling the request, and then how you know how much request it's arriving, and then ah, it's yeah. 
you know, things like that. Um, Dude, but doesn't Roman, you've you got a metric, right? Again. Pardon? You've got a metric you added for this, right? It was the rate limiting, um, yeah. something like that. You had a, you had a uh, but metric. I edited after Marcello did his test, so he didn't have done in the evalu evaluation yet. Ah. But, oh, which yeah. metric? The, the there is the rate limit uh, metric exposed. Um, oh, uh, I can I include that in the then. yeah five nine six three. Okay, I can include that in the dashboard in our dashboard now. Yeah, so this would so if you want to find the optimal value for a specific size, you could for instance just start with the default values, run the test. You would see it. You would see the rate limiter kicking in in this metric. You could increase it, run increase it, run the same test until the rate limit that doesn't get hit anymore. That would be a possibility. And that's probably what you talked about, right? Sorry, I missed this PR, so yeah. Okay, Yeah. I, I, I will take a, have a look on that and to include that. Yeah, it will be very interesting. Yeah, so that's, so it's, what was it? Five, five, nine, six, three, Martello. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually thinking like we could, that's another test we could do. We could change QPS um, to see how it, uh, um like how much like we see like maybe like maybe it could be a tell for us like see like okay it's just we're just being rate limited like crazy um let's see how uh the rate limits uh metric is affected it can at least get us to a point where we could figure out okay well what should we be at it would be interesting too to see like if um you know how this how this changes based on scale like you know just a different um like how it how it moves based on our environment, and keeping a um, if we do those kind of tests, we should also have it like maybe a separate dashboard for it, where you also look at the at least API server metrics to see at what point we put too much on that, but are better for it's better for us because it's always be, going to be a balance. Yeah, that's the scale part of this. Yeah, I, that. That, that's the other thing with this QPS change that it could kind of wonder like what is it that's um, like what is the you know what's what's going to be our effect like if we're what we don't want is like if we're just increasing QPS to say something's inefficient and we're just increasing QPS and a ma mass a problem so uh, let's so something I guess we can keep in mind so it's actually really good so that this is dynamic because we're gonna I think it won't be really easy to test uh, a number of these things so yeah. That'll be, that'll be helpful. Okay. Does this, my only last question was like, um, I don't know, is, uh, is you use here or Tomas, like, do, do you guys remember what the, um, what we set the uh, QPS burst to for all of these? I think uh, it was around 30 or 40. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was, was something around 30. Was it just on the controller or was it, uh, was it for um, uh, I think we also set it for, for the Virt controller and Virt API as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think maybe we can do some testing and see like I it would do, I think we definitely need this. It's I mean it's a question of like whether this whether these two change. Maybe we can make some we can do this some testing and find out if these should be higher at defaults or whatever. So that should be. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, thanks, Roman. All right. This, so that's the last item. Do we have, <clears throat> are there any other PRs that, out there that we want to talk about? Um, Maybe um, the one related to the maximum number of VMs per node. I included here it, the, last, the, the last item, actually. So. This one? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just to contextualize very quickly, um, it's, uh, you know, I think we already discussed that. So Kubernetes, the Kubelet has some pod limits. That's default 110, and we can increase that easily. Um, and however, the Kube handler, I have, Kube handler also has some, uh, you know, parameter for that with the maximum device, which is actually the number of VMIs. It's, even though the name doesn't look that, but it reflects that it's the maximum number of, it really implies that it's the maximum number of VMIs per node. 
However, the virt operator that actually creates the virt handler, the daemon set, has some very strict reconciliation. So if we change the virt handler daemon set, the virt operator will overwrite that. So we cannot change things unless we apply some, uh, some things. For example, HCO, which we are not using the kube CI, uh, can patch and change the default values from the controllers that virtual operator is doing. Roman pointed some way to do that directly. I didn't check that, sorry. Yeah, so, but... so yeah, all I meant, uh, you have, yeah, so it's, we we have, so HCO is just using the kube word patch support there. That's basically what I meant. Mm -hmm. So if you go to 3.6.12, the PR link there, you can just directly define the keyboard CR. When you go down a bit, a little bit more in the patch section here, you see, for instance, you can, uh, uh, yeah, you can just do a, a JSON patch on root controller like described here. Ah, oh, okay. It's more or less similar what HCO is doing, I see. Yeah. I think HCO is just passing it through to that section, but I'm not sure. Ah, maybe okay. they implemented it directly. I don't know, but yeah. Okay, uh, so we can use that or the, the, the I submit a PR. So if you can, Ryan, if you can go back to the, the other page. Yeah, yeah. so the, the down the page. Yeah, so not sure. So we can discuss that if it makes sense or not. It's similar to what we discussed that, but this PR actually uh, was also something that, uh, you know, David mentioned. I looked for the max number of pods and I used that as the maximum number of device. So right now it's hard coded for 110, but we can just search that value for the maximum number of pods and use that. That's the PR is doing so. I've, I've, I've checked the APR a little bit. Uh -huh. um, historically, my opinion was to just set the number very high to two, to 1,000 or 2,000 instead of 110. I'm not sure if that is an option. Um, with this approach, my main problem was is only that we have a few edge cases which are hard to catch. One is when the default configuration path is changed, obviously. And the other one is when the value is changed while the daemon set is running, we're also not picking it up. Can it be? Yeah, so um, it makes sense, especially because you see, you, you see some tests are failing because it's complaining about the, the path of the file for some yeah. reason in the, <laughs> in the environment. Yeah. Doesn't find the path of the file for some reason. Um, and it makes sense. Um, the, 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 the thing of the change in the parameter, I think I, I kind of leave the priority of the, 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 for the flag, but you know. Um, I don't know what David is thinking, but David, maybe you remember our discussions back then that I was just wanted to set the number very high. Um, set to 500, sure. set to 1,000, yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, I wanted to set it to 2,000 always. If David is fine with, with that too, just set it fixed to that number and go on. David? Yeah. Yeah, so just change yeah, the fine. 110 default to 2,000 and that's it. Okay, so. Fixed in the PR, not even patch really in your PR. Setting to 2,000 is the default value. Uh-huh. I can, yeah, revert this change here and just put the 2000, yeah. So you want to, what you're saying is like set the number of VIVs really high and Kubernetes is going to block us anyway, right? Because it's got a max number of pods. So it just doesn't yeah, matter what so we set. This is the only, the only reason why it's, it's why we have this number at all is because device plugins are not really meant to expose unlimited resources or devices, but DevKVM yeah. is, is unlimited from the perspective. It's like dev null or something. It's just there. It's not like you request one dev KVM and another one requests another dev KVM. And basically we just have this number because the underlying device plugin ex 
wants us to give it a number a quantity i see but there's no real i mean we will see it on the pr then in theory there could be some inefficiencies in the kubelet when we set it to a high number then we would probably just go with thousand or something but yeah set it to a number that's slightly out of reach that's all we have to do so one thousand one thousand is totally fine yeah, if we let's don't, take 1, uh, i've never seen somebody want to launch over 500 pods per node so uh, you know open shift in the previous 500 yeah yeah in but the previous call i mentioned they they pushed open shift to 300 or 500 and that was the maximum they tried so far i think yeah then let's take 1000 and reevaluate it when it's time for it but even yeah. for a virtual machine so i think you know 1000 will be like a two ways high isn't it so it's i think it's fine yeah perfect yeah let's take it's not approach. even a virtual machine limit this is like roman said this is a limit that doesn't mean anything really yeah it's not it also won't anything. cause file descriptors being open too much or something we, we don't care i mean an irrelevant amount <laughs> okay <laughs> okay all right, Marcel, I think you got your answer. Great, thanks. All right, cool. All right, um, <clears throat> we got nine minutes left. Um, are there any other things we want to discuss? Yeah, I I had the Grafana dashboard. And this one. so if you deploy now the Kubvirt um, CI with Grafana, you can see the dashboard that I was using the tests that I did. I guess we have to wait until tomorrow, so until we merge it in Qubit Master. But yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. W when it's written merge, it it's not merged actually. So when it's merged here, you will we have a periodic job which twice a day I think uh, takes the latest release from Qubit CI and creates a PR in Qubit. Ah. Okay. And when the tests pass there with the new provider, only then we merge it. That's a precaution so that mm -hmm. we know that. It, the Kubert tests have no downtime, basically. It makes it a little bit more cumbersome to propagate changes, but the Kubert tests are then more guaranteed to, to work. Is so the, um, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, where's the, the link to the dashboard? I was trying to find it. Or is this something that's like I can't see? You can't see it unless you run your own. Uh, uh, OK. Cluster. So it's part of our like dev workflow. Yeah, it's 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 this will be the same thing that you see in the report that I did. So, so I I don't. This would be like if if I did. Um, so we we like right now the Prometheus is in like make cluster up right. So if I did make cluster up and then check Prometheus, I'd see it or Grafana, I'd see it. Yeah, as that's it should be. Saying. As Rama mentioned, it's not there yet, but maybe tomorrow. And. Okay. I'm going to include the new metrics that you guys mentioned, so I will update this uh, dashboard. Oh yeah, that was um, um, we had discussed on the uh, on Slack. There is I found a few more. That, that's what you're talking about, right? Um, like for um, inside of uh, what's it um, controller or the work queue metrics? Like there was uh, oh I wish I had the link. Let me see if I can find it. There was a ton of them that I that I oh, found. Oh, the retry, is it retry? And I include that one. Um, but we, we can we, I can double check. So um, if you can just highlight again those those metric and double check if everything is in the. Yeah, I was uh, I found it here. Um, it was. I think I didn't check that, sorry. Um, yeah, that's where I got a bunch of the descriptions for some of these. So, um, but you had most of these. It was uh, it was a few of them that were not there. Um, yeah, the, the retry. So it was Yeah, missing. I don't remember which one that I mentioned. Oh, actually, I have. I oh, yeah, there it is. Work, yeah, work, yeah, work duration and retries. That's what it was. Yeah, it's this one. Work duration, we have. We have. Yeah, that was. Um, yeah, it was the it was the number of retries. So this will give us the. 
Um, how does it define it? I think it's total number of retries handled by the work queue. Yeah, this one. And there's some other stuff like rate loaner and stuff in here. Um, I don't know, but there is, I don't know if we're hitting any of these, but there was some interesting ones. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. Thanks, Marcelo. That's cool. Um, all right. Are there any other open items then? Uh, in, in your last minute. What I, left? what I wanted to bring up was the, um, that I wanted to look at the amount of uh, left around goal routines. Um, because that's quite concerning. A that we go to like we're growing exponentially, and B that we have so many leftover coroutines. I've been looking at a few parts of this and other things, and I'm gonna have a look. Okay. Yeah, I've got it in this um, this issue, Kevin. Um, yeah, like the, how the go routines climb like this. A, a the the stairs when we scale down, but also the growth seems um, unproportional to the amount of VMs we create. Okay. Um, any other things? Four minutes left. Okay. Um, all right. So, like, uh, like I said, we can revisit the first topic um, for the meeting. So, I mentioned I'll be out next week. Um, if folks want to have a meeting, um, David, you said you're okay with hosting it. If that makes sense, if you have some items you want to discuss, um, yeah, I'll leave it to you, and I'll have. <clears throat> I'll, I'll send you the admin code just so you have the ability to record and everything. And then, um, yeah, if you have an agenda and then it makes sense to have it, feel free. Yeah. Do you, so do people want to meet next week? Uh, yeah. I'm fine with hosting it. It's fine for me. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Perfect. All right, everybody. Oh, Thank you very nice. much. All right. Bye. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.